Chris Conacher, founder of ComputerAudioFile.com. And uh, it's a site. How many of you have been to the site? And how many have no clue what the site is? OK, talking to you. <laughs> um, so the site is, I kind of call it, the convergence of high tech and hi fi. Uh, this, the name has computer in it, but that doesn't mean that's all we talk about. Um, so pretty much it's anything digital. And other than CDs, uh, God, I haven't spun a CD for years. So, uh, but other than that, network audio, USB audio, disk storage, you name it, we talk about it. Uh, and there's a user forum here where you can ask your questions and answer questions if you have them or not or whatever, just browse. So um, I started the site in 2007 and in 2009 I quit working for anybody else and uh, since then I've been doing the site full time. Um, so this seminar is applications and endpoints. So what I thought I would do is kind of talk about two of the main uh, applications people are using for managing their library and playback. Uh, J River and Rune. Yes, there's a million other ones out there, but I'm, I'm going to focus on those two. Uh, they're very, very different. Um, ooh, 2.30 presentation. Okay, I'm here. Um, snoozing. Yeah, does that mean you have to leave? Yeah, it says snoozing. I, I just want to stop it. Well, there we go. Stop. Okay, so JRiver and Rune, very, very different programs. And some people like both of them. I like both of them. Some people are like, I will only use JRiver, and others, I will only use Rune. And some people are like, what's Rune? Uh, what did I Rune? You know, stuff like that. So we'll talk about that, and I'll show some examples of some of the coolness of each. And then we'll talk about some audio endpoints. Those are really, really popular right now. So. When I mention endpoints, I mean like the Sonore Micro Rendu, the SOTM SMS 200, or even a Raspberry Pi, or the $8 Nano Neo Pi, or the J River Id Pi, all kinds of options. So it's like if you want to geek out and order an $8 part from China, you can configure it yourself, go sick, it's fun, works. Or if you want to buy something that's already made, you plug it into your network and it just works, you can do that too. So we'll talk about all that. Um, and I want to make sure I cover what you guys want to know. You know, I don't want to talk here for an hour and not address what you want to know. So, um, how many people are even familiar when I say audio endpoint? Do you even know what I'm talking about? And just be honest, so I cover what you guys want to know. Who has no clue? Like, what are you talking about? Audio endpoint. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so, let's start with the applications. Um, how many people have used J River? And how many people, that's kind of their app of choice, that's what they're using now? Okay. How many people have no clue what JRiver looks like or how it works? Or, okay, cool. Um, so let's show a couple of cool things, a couple of basic things. So this is JRiver Reader Center running on Mac. Um, the, the app originally came out for Windows only, but now it's Mac and Linux, and they've really expanded. It's quite cool. So I like to look at JRiver as an app for people who want total control over what they see, over their metadata, uh, albums, you name it, it's total control. If, if you want to browse by album, artist, whatever, you can do that like most applications. But also, some people, I call it really old school, but they want to browse by the file structure. Their folders are named by, you know, like artist, album, and tracks, and that's how they listen. And if that works, Awesome, you know, it's whatever works for you is cool. Uh, so JRiver lets you do that. Browse by, you know, let's see what's in my DSD folder. Art Pepper, whatever, there's the albums. I can click on it and play it. So be it. Um, and, you know, or it's straight up albums. And also, okay, let's go into these guys. So it's kind of, a, for lack of a better term, it can be a spreadsheet type interface. Um, so, you know, you can pull up the bottom there, albums up top, and something about J River as opposed to Rune is I can go in here, I can say rename, I need somebody to, done. Rune, you can't do that. 
totally different. It's a different approach. So if you are somebody who has ripped all your music, J River will rip music as well. Rune will not rip music. If you're somebody who's ripped all your music and taken a lot of time with your metadata, um, I know a lot of classical fans are meticulous with all their metadata. I mean, metadata is important, right? I, I don't want to listen to untitled dot, what, untitled one dot wave, right? Nobody wants to have 17 untitled tracks. Uh, so metadata is critical, uh, but J River will display your metadata exactly how you put it in there versus Rune, no. It may use your metadata, but it's not gonna show it to you without a different configuration. It's just a different way of doing things. Um, so some people, they wanna see their exact metadata. Cool, that's what you like, awesome. Um, so let's rename this one back. Done, I mean, it's just a few clicks and you're done. And also in J River, boom, I just right click that. And I have all kinds of things I can show. Some of this is embedded metadata that I put in there. Some of it came with the riff. And there's really no way to have this type of view in J River or a lot of other applications. So one thing I really, really like is dynamic range. So are you, are you guys familiar with dynamic range and the DR numbers? Okay, so you're familiar with the loudness wars? Uh, you know, over the last few years, the sound of music has gotten louder and the dynamics have been crunched. So the difference between the lowest, the, the quietest, and the, the loudest have been compressed. It's, it sounds like crap. So uh, what I like to do is display the dynamic range of what I'm listening to. Uh, it's kind of geeky, but it's also kind of cool to know. So if you have, let me find something where I have several copies of the same album. So I'm a big Pearl Jam fan. As you can see. Um, Couldn't tell by your computer. <laughs> okay. So the album 10 was their first album. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight versions of 10. Um, and it may be easier if I it this way to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so dynamic range is showing. Uh, that's a little slow. Let me click on the original. 10, and I'll expand these columns. So these are, this is also, it's just really cool information to have for some people. Other people, like I look at a computer all day. I don't want to look at any of this. I want to click play, not think about it. No worries. So the original album, there's these dynamic range values here. Is that metadata it's pulling from somewhere? Did it okay, I'll, I'll let me show you how, you how I got those. So whenever I add a new album to J River, I select all the tracks, right click, library tools, and analyze audio is not showing up, so okay. I'm doing this on Mac. Oh, I know why it's not showing up. I will get to that later, it's my little surprise. So I, I right click this, I go to library tools, I say analyze audio, and in about a minute, it gives me all the dynamic range values listed right here. So that's built into J River using a standard uh, method to determine that. So there's other applications that will give you the value, they're using the same method. Um, so, Okay, the original album came out. I see a lot of 10s, some 11s, and some 8s. And then the high-res remaster was released. And this is not golf, people. The lower numbers are not better. So <laughs> dynamic range, a bunch of 6s, 7s, 5s. Uh, you know, if, if I don't know which one I want to listen to, sometimes I'll go, oh, the dynamic range sucks on that one, so I'm going to listen to another one. This type of information is what J River is all about showing you. Uh, other applications, say such as Rune, no, it's, it's for right now, that's like too into the weeds uh, for that type of app. It's all what you want to do. So dynamic range, different masters, and then so I also view sample rate, bit depth, bit rate, um, 
And sometimes it's kind of handy to know where exactly the file is stored on your computer. So I just use that. But if you don't want to see any of this, you just uncheck it, boom, bitrate, and it's gone. So it's highly customizable. And for people just getting into this, say, OK, I'm going to use JRiver. Uh, just leave it at the defaults for now. You don't have to do any of this. And then once you get used to it, OK, let's enable bitrate so I can see what bitrate is. I don't know what it means, but now I can see it. Good. Um, so all customizable to, to exactly how you like it. Um, and then, so I'll, I'll get to my little secret I was holding back. Um, so J River also can play to a bunch of different zones. So I have a bunch of zones listed right here. These, I named them audio endpoints. So if I had all these endpoints and I was, and they were on my network, they would all just appear here in J River in DLNA mode or UPnP mode. Um, so I can select the endpoint, click audio, play something to it, and it plays right to it and do that over for whatever zones I want. And then there's the overview screen. I can see everything playing in all my zones. It's quite cool, and the application's like 50 bucks. Back in the day, to play multi-zone audio, and then you know it's, it was expensive. And they also have a J Remote app, so you can do this all from your iPhone. You can play, control volume, do whatever you want, individual zones, and then I can say, okay, I want to link a couple of zones. I'm going to link the J River id pi to my laptop, so whatever I play on my laptop also goes out to the J River id pi, and it's not rocket science. So. If I go around a little too fast, if you're not familiar with the app, just you know, download the free trial and play around with it for a while. It, you're not going to break anything. Um, so then I can go in here, unlink the zone, boom, I'm back to individual zones. Um, so this library that I have loaded here is probably five terabytes. And this laptop contains, I don't know, 128 gigabytes. So how do we do that? JRiver lets you connect to any library in the world, as long as you have the code. So what I did was say, I want to add my library, and I'm going to add my home library. So I put in that, and I put in my access key. I hit OK, put in my username or password. And now I have my complete home library accessible on this laptop. I can play music at home if I want. Right here it says there USB. That's probably a USB DAC connected to my computer at home. So one copy of all your music, but it can stream anywhere around the world as long as you're connected to the internet. No port forwarding, no PC. There's one port forward you need to do. So if you're familiar with port forwarding, you go into your router and say, I want to forward port like 51.299 to the IP address of the computer running JRiver. And if that's Greek, there's a million instructions out there on how to do it, but it's very simple. Um, nothing else is needed. Uh, and what's really cool about it, you don't have to know your IP address at home. So it's like, okay, how do I connect to my house if I don't know my IP address at home? JRiver has done something really cool. Um, and Okay, so it's not going to show there, but I'll show it up here. So on this add to library, I put in this access key that's listed within J library. It's like a six digit key. Um, and so since that key is set on my computer at home, it talks with J River and says, okay, if anybody looks for this key, here's the way to route it. So you don't have to know this. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. So you just have to know your access key. So I put it in, it talks to J River and says, what is his public IP address at home? And automatically connects them. So this is getting passed up to the JRiver Central Server first. Yes. So right the, the only thing that's passed is the association of your access key with your IP address. Right. Yep. So if you don't want JRiver to know the IP address of your wherever you have this, then don't enable it. Uh, for me, they can go sick with that information. I don't care. Um, let's see here. So yeah, I'm. This is my home library. Um, and if I just wanted to play my local library, let's do that. And there we go. So if I'm on an airplane, it's my local library. Everything here is on the hard drive. And it all plays normally. 
I still have the same zones, I still have everything. Um, so when I was showing you before, the analyze feature wasn't showing up. And that was because the audio that I had selected was at home. So now this audio is on my laptop. I have every option available. I can analyze it and show the DR numbers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't, I don't want to cover all of this too fast. Who has like questions about J River or dying to know something about J River while I'm focused on it? Yes. So let's say I want to add a tag called <clears throat> number of singers, for example. Does that add that tag to the uh, track or the J River database or both? No, there's no such thing as a J River database. Um, so if I want to edit tags, so by default, it just shows you a few tags, what it thinks are relevant. I do show all tags. So now I can see, let's, uh, I can see everything possible that I can associate with these files. So some of this is automatically generated, some of it's not. Some of it comes from whoever you purchased the file from. So this was downloaded from Pearl Jam and they decided to fill in some of this information. So pretty cool. But if I want to say orchestra is Joe Six, Joe Six Pack, now that's embedded. So if I take that file, open it up on some other application, that will still be there. That travels with the file. Very handy. That's flat only, not wave. So good point. The file format I'm using here is FLAC. If I were to use a file format such as WAVE, the number of tags would be severely limited. You can embed metadata into WAVE. Most applications won't be able to read it. It's very hit and miss. So I say just don't do it. Uh, if you like to listen to WAVE files, then it's a trade-off. Your metadata is going to be half as, not nearly half as good as FLAC. That's why I love FLAC. Uh, AIFF. It's uh, kind of a wave equivalent. Metadata is a little bit better. It's still not like FLAC. How do you, uh, how do you compress your FLAC? Do you do uncompressed FLAC or do you compress it? Okay, very good question. So FLAC gives you a range. I can do totally zero compression FLAC or I can compress up to like the number eight or nine or 10. Um, so I used to do totally uncompressed FLAC. I'm like, I don't need to save disk space. Why would I compress this? And by compression, I don't mean getting rid of any data. I just mean compressing the file size. It's not lossless. It's, I mean, it's not lossy, it's lossless. So uncompressed FLAC can, what I call, choke uh, components from some manufacturers. If I send an uncompressed FLAC file to a specific DAC, it won't be able to play it. And so I ran into this, and I read the user manual, and it says, we support FLAC compressed between levels 4 and 8. I mean. Ridiculous, yes. I mean, so now I'm thinking uh, maybe I should have just kept the default flat compressed six or whatever the default is, and I would have been fine. So, kind of up to you guys. Do what you want, and but that's kind of my story with flat compression. Yes, sir. Two questions. I have a lot of uh, CDs on digital. I haven't used J River yet. They're all compressed in Apple Lossless. Is that a problem? Okay, so Apple lossless, okay, it's not a problem. It's, okay. You're not like down any dead end or anything like that. Um, as long as it's in a lossless format. Um, so when Apple lossless was an Apple only thing, there was a couple of weird quirks, maybe not specifically with JRiver, possibly, but with other apps. Um, now it's open sourced. I, I believe JRiver will support it just fine. Um, but if it doesn't, you can always convert that to any other format you want. And it's very easy to do with like a, say a program DB Power Amp. Uh, set up your options, right click a music folder, and it will convert every single thing you have in one click. You walk away, go have dinner, come back, and it's done. So it's not, you know, it's not like yeah. you've got to watch it or anything like that. Um, it's very easy. Second question. Yes. I didn't download the artwork originally. Is there a way to, does J River get artwork? Or get yes. So J River is fully capable of getting artwork if you don't have artwork. And it'll, it'll do two things, which I really, really like when it comes to artwork. So 
I like embedded metadata because then my files can be anywhere with any application, and if they support embedded metadata, that album art is there because it's a mobile fidelity release. I want that specific cover, right? It's so you really know. Um, so JRiver will embed it. And then I also tell it, put the file of the picture in with the files that are on the album. It's kind of a belt and suspenders approach because back in the day, what, two years ago, some apps would only look in the, in the folder where all the files were. Is there a JPEG in there? And then if there is, that must be the album art, so that's what I'm going to use. So if you do belt and suspenders like JRiver does, then you're covered. And so why not? It's like you set it up and you're done. Um, let's see here. It's probably, let's see if I can find it really quick. Somebody else probably knows exactly where it is. Cover art. Here we go. So I want to put the cover art in the same folder as the file, and I want to name it folder.jpg. Ridiculous name. Why couldn't it be called like album art or art if they wanted one word, but whatever. That's kind of a convention that everybody has settled on because somebody had to start it and you know, we're stuck with it. Um, call it what you want, it probably still work, but I would call it folder.jpg. Um, and then also store the image in the files tag is checked. So right there's your belt and suspenders. Um, so there's that. Couple other quick questions on JRiver. We can always circle back to it too. Y yes. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed the one problem with that is documentation. I mean, obviously it's intuitive to a larger extent. You can learn it, but is Wikipedia is it Wikipedia that has the how to use basically? Okay, so JRiver has its own wiki. Is that what you're thinking yeah. of? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, big complaint with every single software company in high-end audio is no documentation. How do I learn this? You know, I. So they have the wiki, <laughs> that's all I can say. And they have a user forum that's very active, but then again, it's okay, let me figure out what I don't know. And sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? And how do I know about these hidden features? Um, so hopefully I've been able to give you a few hidden features here. Um, and if you wanna know how to do something specific too, I will gladly help, but yeah, no really, like, no solid user manual that you can sit there and figure it all out with. Rune, on the other hand, they have finished their user manual. I don't know if it's published yet, but it will be very shortly. So let's flip over to Rune. Really quick, you did say that JRiver is supported in Linux now? Yes, JRiver is supported on Linux now. Yep. Um, when will it support Tidal? My guess is never. Um, but that's something you can also bring up with JRiver. Uh, I think. If more people continue to ask for it, they may change their minds. I don't know. Um, so here's Rune. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rune, Rune started out as a product called Sulus in like 2005 or six. Um, it's just it's like a couple of guys decided to start this. What do we do with all our things? And they ended up with Rune. Well, they first ended up with Sulus, and then Meridian bought Sulus, so it became Meridian Sulus. And then as part of Meridian, HP approached them to do, I believe it was called the like HP Connected Music, and they developed an app based on Sulus for HP. And then the team that started it all spun out from Meridian to create their own company called Fruit. It's a very cool story, much longer than I can tell, and the guys are really, really cool to talk to, but they're based all over the world now. They don't have like a home base or anything like that. Um, so they started Rune. It's not the application released to the public is new, but it's not a new company. These guys have been doing this for a while. They know what they're doing. Um, so let me talk about pricing. This has, lately on my site, a few people are talking about they don't like the price of Room. So J River, 50 bucks the first time you buy it, or 49 or whatever. Upgrades are like 20, 25, depending on when you get it. Um, upgrades come out for J River every year, but you don't have to upgrade. You just use it unless you want a new feature. Rune is, I believe, $120 a year or $500 for a lifetime license. That's the options. Um, some people are like, no chance, I'm never paying that. Okay, fine. Um, to me, it's way worth it. I pay for it myself. Um, uh, so 
whatever everybody makes that judgment. So this is seriously you're not writing that off as a business expense. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> business expense, but I pay for it myself. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't have to. I can get it for free, but I buy it. Um, so, kind of a philosophy with Rune, um, the way I look at it, not maybe the way they look at it, but how I do, is they have, it's like they've been doing this for a long time, and it's not, it's not like they know what you want, but they know how to display a collection and make it an immersive experience, um, and so you give up some control with Room. Your metadata is not displayed by default. So when I added all of this stuff to the library, it goes out to several databases and says, OK, here's what album we think this is, and here's the cover art we think this should have. Um, but a really nice thing is, if I misspelled my tags and my metadata, or if I did anything weird, it doesn't care. It gets the correct metadata, or what it thinks is the correct metadata, and often it's right. Um, so it's kind of got you out of the metadata mode. And for a lot of people, that's really, really cool. Um, so on the overview screen, it's kind of nice. It tells you how many tracks you have, how many albums you have, artists and lyrics and all that kind of stuff. Pretty cool. Um, and it's just kind of a overview of your collection. They have jumpstart your collection, which is pretty cool. So don't worry, these albums are stored. OK, so I, I have this connected to title. And I can say, give me these essential albums from title that they think are essential or whatever, and add them to my library. And boom, now I have them added to my library. So what added to library means is this is, is a really, really cool integration. So the two albums on the left, Steve Perry and Nora Jones, are from Tidal. They have the little title symbol in the upper left-hand corner. The other four albums are stored locally on my laptop. Without that little title symbol, you would never know it. So if you subscribe to Tidal, you have access to like 30 million tracks. That's way too many tracks. And they could do it separate. like. OK, if you want to browse title, actually, they, they do separate it as well. OK, let me browse title and find what I want. There's 30 million tracks. You know, go for it. But they just decided, we'll integrate the whole thing. So adding it to your library doesn't mean you're downloading the files. It's just put it, it's making you, it's, it's making it part of your library by putting links. They look exactly the same, but really, it's a link. So. Let's see here, are all of these title? Probably. So yeah, these are all from title, but without that little symbol, you wouldn't know it. So then whenever I click on it, and it shows up exactly like if it's local, and I hit play album, then it streams from title, versus playing off my laptop. No, totally seamless to the end user. And to me, that is such an invaluable feature. New releases come out on Friday. I click Add to Library. So I can have my title app in my car, playing through my car, and a new release comes out. I click Favorite in the title app. It shows up in Rune, added to my library at home. Way cool. Yes? Can you download? Uh, currently, you cannot download. Um, the, so you can't download with the title app either. Uh, the only way. You can try and like edge them to enable that. It's, it's a title restriction. Is to tell them that well, DJs want to use this during their shows, so they're going to need it downloaded. So enable that feature. <laughs> That's about it. Otherwise, they're going to they ain't going to do it. So, how, what is the integration with both of these with the iPhone? I mean, I use iTunes, and I can sync with my iPhone, take my music with me. Okay. V yeah. Very good question. So, syncing with the iPhone is kind of old school, and at least from my perspective. It, it works great. Um, and so I'll compare this to Jay River and how they do for mobile. So Rune has an iPhone app and an iPad app. Currently, there's no way to even stream back to your phone or download to your phone or do anything. Currently. Jay River's app 
you can stream from anywhere in the world your whole collection right to your phone. So if you're at home or if I'm here, I can stream that entire collection here. I don't have to sync or put anything on here. If you don't have an unlimited data plan, that sucks, right? So, then, so what I do is I don't want to have to sync from iTunes or anything like that. So in Tidal, I just use the offline feature and download whatever I want to my phone through Tidal. Granted, I can't get my mobile fidelity releases because they're not available. So it's, it's kind of a give and take with everything, right? You have to sync. I'm not syncing, but then I don't have what you have. It's a type of thing. You know? So yeah, that is a, is a thing. But I think Rune may address that soon. It would be really cool. Um, so another really, so when I first saw this, I'm like, okay, I know this band, Blackstone Cherry, and okay, I read this once about their history or whatever Megan Fry thinks about them. And okay, cool picture. I'm never going to look at that again. Why, is, why do I look at it every time? But, oops, the information in here, I, I keep going back to it because, okay, oh yeah, who's, who's in this band? Okay, I can click on the person's name, then it shows me what else they're in. And then I can see the title, main albums. Oh, he's that too. It works better if I use somebody that everybody knows. So Miles Davis, yeah, yeah, you probably know all of this information. Um, but then say, okay, who's Paul Chambers? Oh, that's who Paul Chambers is. Um, here's who he was a member of. Oh, Miles Davis Quintet. And it's just this endless link to more music that's related to the music you like. It's, it's not the 50 million title tracks of which 499, 49 million, whatever, you don't care about. Um, this is all related to your stuff. So then I think, okay, let's check out this album. Again, other links up here, but what I think is the coolest thing of all time in Room is the credits. So now that we're downloading stuff and streaming stuff, we don't have the liner notes anymore. And I always used to look at the liner notes to see who mastered the album. That's just what I did. I wanted to know. Or I wanted to know where was it recorded. I mean, for whatever reason, that's what I wanted to know. And some people probably are the same way. Uh, so I look at this and go, oh, this is a Rudy Van Gelder remaster. Right here it says. And I can click on Rudy Van Gelder, get a little info about him. Oh, and here's the albums in my collection that he uh, was a part of or remastered. He, for production, he was a part of 1,232 albums in title. And, oh, who else did he collaborate with or associated with? Um, and then I'll be like, hmm, who played drums on that album? Oh, Art Taylor. Here's what else he played on. And for me, like, just getting into this kind of music, I had no clue. I was like, who is Art Taylor? And, whoa, I have a lot of stuff he played on. This is really cool. Um, so the ability to just kind of like swim through your collection is, is priceless. I listen to much more music now than ever before because I can just weave through the stuff I've pre-selected as what I like. That's my library. It's telling me Art Taylor was the drummer on these albums that I have in my library. And then if I want to go out to title, the main album's there, I also have those added. It's just, it's really, really cool. And to some people, they don't want any of this. They want to be able to go. They know what they want to listen to. They want to go to the folder, find the artist, find the album, find the track, and press play. It's just a different philosophy. And Jay River allows you to do that. Rune right now doesn't. There's no way I can go in here and go, oh, I want to go to my D drive and browse that and play it. Can't do it. So just different philosophies. Yes? Uh, any, I have multiple computers. I'm sure many of us do. Yes. What's the license? Okay, so really, really cool feature of Rune is you need what they call one Rune core or Rune server. So right now this laptop is a Rune server. It handles the Rune database. It knows where all your music is because you've told it where it is. And any other computer you have just runs the Rune client. So it functions exactly the same way. 
just the database is here. And you start it up and it automatically finds it. So you just pay for one single license. If you want more than one server, you need another license, but I don't know why you would want more than one. Because it's, you make changes here, then you gotta make changes over there. So it just, it, it's, it's really, really cool. And I can pull this up and say, other rune instances will, will appear right here. And I can send audio to them. Or they're de attached devices. It's just, it's a really cool ecosystem. Um, so let's, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll go over this. So right now it's outputting to my MacBook Pro. This is what they call zones, so audio zones. And I can say, oh, let's output via HDMI. Okay, let's do exclusive mode. And here's the, the sample rates in green. It automatically knows what's supported via HDMI. The ones in red, not gonna support it. And you have a few other options here, but you really don't have to do any of that. I can just say enable and give it a name, and that's it. So now, there it shows up right there. If I wanna send different music to that, I say okay. Now I'm playing to my HDMI. Let's play a whole artist of Art Taylor. And that's gonna stream from Tidal. My internet connection is not really good right now. So otherwise I'd be playing another wonderful speaker. Oh, listen to that. Uh, and then if I want, I can say, well, I wanna play the same thing in both of those zones. Done, now the zones are grouped. I mean, it's very simple. And like a few years ago, that was like space age. You know, and it was either you play everything to the same zone or you play one zone at a time and whatever. And then, oh, you want volume control, individual zones, all zones, whatever, you can do it all. Um, Does it support Airport Express? It supports AirPlay. So Airport Express will show up right here. Um, and so many of the manufacturers that are displaying hardware in the other building are working on rune ready implementations. So if they have an ethernet input or Wi-Fi, they will show up in audio setup right here. It'll say rune ready devices on your network. You don't have to know anything about it. It just shows up that you say, oh, here's what I want to name it. Boom, done. Now you can select audio and play right to it. So um, let's see. So that, that kind of segues into audio endpoints, but let's, let me just, I'll, answer quick questions about Rune, then I'll cover endpoints, and then we can add, talk about whatever you want. So this guy was first, back here. Thank you. Uh, if you haven't set up the endpoint, I have older equipment, mm -hmm. so it's not Rune ready. Yep. If I wanted to do Rune, is that a problem? Not a problem whatsoever. Okay, that answers the question. Yes, okay. Let's. I'll talk about that in, in right. endpoints, yeah, and yeah. how to resolve your issue. Because yeah, many people have DACs that are great, expensive, don't want to change, whatever. We can work around that. So yes. So can you sync between the two apps? So what I do is somewhat of a sync. My music is stored on a network attached storage, NAS drive, and J River looks at that NAS and Rune looks at that NAS. Whatever I add ends up in both. So in a way, yes, they're synced. But not playlists. Play yeah, it's, there you go. Playlists not synced. Yes? You answered the question about multiple computers on Rune, but you didn't answer it on JRiver. Okay, so JRiver, uh, there's different ways to do it. I think, I think you get one license when you purchase it, and if you want to run it on other computers, okay, you could probably do it against the license. You have like 10 installs where you got to email them and do whatever, but the way I would do it is how I did it connecting to my house. So I would say, I want to, I'm running J River here, if I, or I'm running J River on another computer. If I want to use the same library, I would do add library right there. And then the music comes up and you're playing it. So you don't have two libraries. If you had two separate installations of J River and you made changes on one, say a playlist, they don't show up on the other one. So just having a single library is really the way to do it. But I think you may, you probably have to purchase another copy to do that now that I think about it. For each you install. Mean you have one library and three computers, you would need four copies. Of you know, I, I think Media Center requires a license for each computer. I think. It didn't used to unless they've changed the rules recently. Do you know what the rules were? I had it installed legally on four different computers in my home. Yeah, I thought five was 
Was it five? Okay, cool. Awesome. I I don't know it. Okay, um, but so that said, it's a client server system as well. Ideally, you would have a, a server that would be the primary yep. database, and then your other clients, regardless of licensing, whatever, yep. would connect to it. Yeah, yes. And then, so you would run into the little limitations like I ran into with Analyze Audio. I would have to be on my server version to do that. But yeah, very true. Uh, yes? One last question. Sure. Is there a difference on the, you know, how it sounds between J River and Room? Okay. So the seminar just got extended six hours. <laughs> um, so the only evidence I have is by going out to my site and seeing everybody talking about the differences in sound quality. Right. It's all up to you. You know, if you listen to iTunes and you listen to J River and you think there's a sound dif difference in sound quality, you will probably think there's a difference in sound quality between J River and Room. If you don't, then you won't. You know. Well, B, they're both free to try. Yeah. You like one, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's where that. So let's talk about endpoints. So let's talk about, let's, let's start with that one. If you have a DAC right now that doesn't have an Ethernet or Wi Fi input on it, but you want it to show up as an endpoint in Room, what you get is a product, let's see. like this. You can kind of see the pictures. It's size of a credit card, Ethernet input on one side, USB output on the other side. So if your DAC has USB in, now your DAC will be seen on the network because of this device. This device is a Rune endpoint, in addition to many other things that this device can do. But this is one way to grab any DAC that has USB input and make it show up as a Rune endpoint and be on your network. Okay, so what if your DAC doesn't have a USB input, right? We have an old DAC, no, it's got AES input or Toslink or whatever. Uh, then, let's see, who has, I can't think of devices right now that have Ethernet in, AES or SPDIF out that are Rune ready, but you can connect to this uh, USB to whatever converter you want. USB to AES, USB to SPDIF and then you connect it to your DAC. It, kind of, it may sound like this to this to this to this, too many steps, but the audio will be bit perfect when it gets to your DAC. Uh, it doesn't change a thing unless you want to change it. You can make adjustments. Um, so that's one device on how to get you there. Um, so there are many other devices like this that I kind of mentioned before. The SOTM, how many people have heard of SOTM? Okay, they have a little device like this, the SMS200. You install it on your network, shows up as a Rune endpoint in addition to other endpoints, and you open up Rune, and there it is. You just like, I want output audio to this device, and your out audio outputs to that device. These things are really, really cool. Um, so now you don't have to wait for your DAC manufacturer to hopefully be Rune ready. They probably will, maybe they won't, maybe they don't like Ethernet inputs or Wi Fi inputs. These devices are the bridge, or some people like these better than their built-in Ethernet input. Whatever reason, that's what they like. Yes? So what about just like, I have a headphone amp right next to my computer. Yes. Is this going to be better than my iMac, significantly audio you know, better than just having it come out the USB of my iMac? Okay, so you're going out of your iMac, USB into the headphone amp? Into a DAC, yeah. Okay, it's, it's kind of like an all-in-one built-in? Or it's a DAC and then an amp. It's okay. Right on my Understood. So that is another audio file thing up to you. Uh, I will say that this is a custom built uh, mini computer designed specifically to output USB audio. They, um, I have a two part article on this uh, where I got a bunch of information from the designers and what did they do, why did they do it with respect to power. If you input power, what happens to it? And because most DACs require power on the USB bus. So is that power clean? Is that power dirty? What happens? Um, and you can use different power supplies with this. So you can use a linear supply if you want. You can use a, an inexpensive iFi power supply with this if you want. So I will say it's probably up to you to figure out if you hear a difference between this and your iMac. 
Um, I would say for me, most definitely, I would be doing this over, I have an iMac as well. I, I never output audio from my iMac. I just don't. That's just me though, right? Um, so, and what I, one thing I did too with this was uh, sitting at my desk, connected it to Ethernet, put uh, AudioQuest Dragonfly in the other side and connected my headphones to it. That's my whole headphone rig sitting at my desk. The micro Rendu, size of a credit card, the AudioQuest Dragonfly, a little bit big, a little bit smaller, and my headphones. That's it. Then I use Rune on my desktop. It shows up. Um, and since AudioQuest has worked with Rune, within Rune, it says, okay, you're sending, I'll show you the audio chain. Uh, we gotta play something for that to show up. Art Taylor. Or let's go local, because that'll play instantly. I know how to get to local. We'll do this, we'll say format, we'll say title, then we'll say not title. Here's my local stuff. It's gray. I'll go over what I just did because it's a pretty cool feature. So here's the path of the audio. Source is FLAC 24192, Macy Gray. Really cool album. Um, Macy Gray's now on Chesky record label. Kind of cool. Uh, so since this uh, projector, max sample rate is 48K. It's, down, it's sample rate converting from 192 to 48. Uh, and uh, let's see, the output OS mixer. So where is it here? What am I going to want Signal path high quality. OK, so if the situation here was outputting to a better device, it would say like lossless. Uh, but it turns green to show that it's high quality sample rate conversion or whatever. Um, shoot, I just lost with, the, forgot what I was gonna show you guys. Well, I'll, I'll move on. So Rune has this thing called Focus. And what I did was I wanna find stuff that's locally on this hard drive, not from Tidal because Tidal streaming right now is slow on this Wi-Fi. So I say Focus. And here's other cool information about your library. Um, so it looks like most of my music is fairly new. Some of it's fairly old. By old meaning that's when it was created. Here's the genres. Um, oops. So I went in and said format. Uh, let's find everything that is title in my library. And then click this plus sign and change it to a minus. Everything that's not title. And then that's everything that's local. I mean, it's very cool, you know? So then, let's reset that. Okay, I want to know everything that's 24192 in this library. Click on it, done. You see, great. Not 24192. Say if I'm outputting to a Dragonfly from Audio Class, <coughs> only supports 2496. There we go. I don't want 24192. It'll sample rate convert it or whatever. Reset some of the other cool things. Okay, who are, want to sort by composer? Sure. It's the composer. I mean, not Dave Krusen, whatever. Um, all kinds of just really cool things that they've added. Uh, yeah, file formats. What's FLAC? Do I have a couple albums that are MP3 that got in there somehow? If I did, it would show up here and I could select that. Or sometimes I'm testing components that come in and I need like DSD 256, the manufacturer says they support it. I don't know if they do, so I just do that. That's my DSD 256, done and done. And let's see if this shows it. It does not, but Rune will, this must not be the version. Rune will identify if something's an MQA file. It'll tell you the MQA sample rate, the original sample rate, kind of nice. But MQA is a topic for another day. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the audio endpoints range from $8 to however much you want to spend. It just pretty much puts your DAC on the network. Really, really good. Um, 
So who's got questions about anything? I don't care what it's about. If you want it about this, cool. Yes? So on Rune, you're paying by month, 10 bucks a month for 20 a year. Yep. Do you have to have an active internet connection on your Rune server device so that they can verify that you're up to date on your page, so to speak? Okay, so yes, okay, yes and no. You don't need an internet connection, so I could turn my, I'll get back to that and turn it off. So right now I have an internet connection and I get all the rich metadata, right? This is what Rune is known for. I get all this and title integration, all that. I don't need the inter internet connection to use it. I can turn that off. Let's close Rune. Reopen Rune. And so I haven't tested it. I'm guessing it checks with the mothership every so often. And okay, if your license has expired, I'm not positive what it does. I think your metadata and stuff like that just doesn't work. Um, so their title login failed. And so after a certain time, I'm guessing the metadata integration doesn't work. I don't think you're SOL. Okay. I think it'll probably work. Um, so yeah, that's how I believe it works. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, um, I have two questions, actually. But one is we're all concerned that we make a commitment to Rune and then Rune fails. Yep. If, are we going to be, is it going to hurt us in any way that you can think of? I mean, it's. OK, very, very good question, right? It's like, so I can pay 120 bucks a, a year, and if Rune fails, the max I'm out is 11 months and 30 days, or you know, whatever. Uh, or I can pay the 500 bucks up front, lifetime, and if they fail, I'm out more money. But those guys have been doing this product since 2005 or six. They have a, a track record. Anybody can fail, you know, it can happen. Um, but you won't be SOL at all, because Rune doesn't do anything to your files. So use Rune for a week, for 10 years, your files will still be the same. And if you want to go, now I'm going to use JRiver. It's like you never used Rune. It doesn't matter. It does absolutely zero. Yes? Second question was under the category of somebody told me at the show. Oh, yes. <laughs> but they said that um, because of what's going on with JRiver and all the different kinds of media that it's dealing with, that you're actually getting all these bells and whistles attached, but on the audio side, really, you might want to stay with an older version of JVerb. Does, does that make sense to you? Okay, it makes sense in that I believe somebody told you that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, let's flip back to JRiver. And so yeah, you see there's audio, there's images, there's video, there's all kinds of these things built in. You can disable them say, now watch, I won't be able to find it, but you can go into like all these features, say I don't want iPod support, iPhone support, FTP upload, Doctor Who, whatever. Um, party mode, notes, links bar. And then they're disabled. So a couple of them probably disappeared from over there. Um, if you're not playing video at the same time as audio, I'm not quite sure how that would affect audio, given the way that audio routes. It doesn't really make sense to me, but if somebody else is listening to this and says, yeah, the, all these bells and whistles now make it sound bad, okay. Let me reword cool. this question and say, do you, is audio still, are they still making the audio portion better? Or are they oh, still yes. on all the bells and whistles? Yes, 100%. Um, so Jay River, their office and all the developers are like 10 minutes from my house. So we have lunch once in a while and I get to grill them with questions and say, people want this, people want that. Or what are you guys doing? Yes, they are very much dedicated to the high-end audio market. Before, several years ago, they didn't know this market existed. They're like, oh, wow, we have a lot of customers in this. So yes, they are very much into this. And new requests, uh, like uh, I want native DSD 512 support. They do it. And then it comes out as a nightly build. So you email Apple for iTunes. I want DSD 512 support. Your email goes off to the dustbin, whatever. You're never going to hear back about it. So yes, Jay River is still doing this, updating the website. Here's the update we did, and this is why, or whatever. Yeah, they're very dedicated. I emailed Apple that. They just get a really fast no. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. OK, what else? No, no other questions? We have, are we out of time? Okay, we got about five minutes. Let's yeah. what? Jay River located. Jay River is located in Minneapolis, okay. about one block from Bel Canto. 
Other questions? Does JRiver support date release? I'm date recorded, not date released. Date recorded, not date released. I saw it on, on, on the other one. Yeah. Okay, so it'll probably show up in, ooh, that's a good question. I don't know, it sorts by date released. When I look at like, uh, I wanna, so I want to create like a 90s playlist, right? Here are all my favorites from the 90s. I don't really care when the album was released. I want to know when it was released. Exactly. Time. So Poison's Greatest Hits that came out in 2013. That doesn't matter. It's from so the 90s. So I saw Rune has that. Yeah, Rune has that. Um, and I think probably original release date may be more important than date recorded. Because do you care if it was recorded in 2012 but the first time well, you heard it? Was, yeah, so, I mean, but whatever, semantics. So where does... Where does J River gets its metadata probably most from your tags. Does it get it from all music or anything or Uh not positive. I, I think it's from your tags and whoever, whatever service you're using as part of your ripper. Okay. Because it, it would it does rip though, so it does pull metadata. Probably from whatever ones are the free options. FreeDB uh, and other sources like that. That's my guess. Because I haven't ripped in J River in years. Um, probably best done on internet search after, but okay, fair enough. yeah. So the way Rune does that is they actually pull metadata from several different sources. Rovi, AMG is like their main deal, but they compare it to several different sources, decide what's best or what needs to be mixed, and come down. It's it's not like it's really simple. We just query and the table of contents on the disk is this or whatever. So it's quite advanced. Can you filter your whole library by? Filter the whole library by a tag. Like, what do you have in mind? Well, I'm thinking off of his question, when you rip an album, you could create a custom tag that says time recorded, and then if you do that from that point mm -hmm. forward, then filter your entire library by that tag, and then have it can create a playlist. You, yes. You could, okay, you could do that viewing files, but that would be pretty ugly, right? Or the whole list of files done then. But I think probably a better way to do that would be a smart list. Um, really cool if you're not familiar with them. You can say, okay, this one's called New Smart List. And I only have audio in here, so I don't really care about media type is audio. But I want to find everything. Let's see if I can search in. Those are all your tags, basically? Yeah, these, are, exactly. So I could search in the comment if you put comment contains 1990 or whatever. Okay, boom, then that playlist would be filled with stuff with a comment of 1990 or whatever tag you want. Standard playlist. Yeah, yeah. And so new music you add, if you add the comment 1990, it shows up in this playlist automatically. So quite cool. What else? Nothing. Yes? Can you think about equalization, you know, capabilities in these programs? Okay, so... Equalization, I don't believe that is in Rune or any DSP yet. Uh, they do volume control. I believe that's the extent of it. J River has extensive capabilities to work with room correction software, uh, convolution, all kinds of things, EQs. So if I go here, that's my audio device. Oops, that's the settings. DSP and output format right here. And equalizer, adaptive volume control, parametric EQ, all kinds of things. Really cool. Um, Multi-channel, you name it, they can do it. Um, so if you need that kind of stuff right now, JRiver is the definite answer. You flew with Open Alaska, which is from um, in the XBFC community. Yes, so yes. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an install basically just XBFC or Cody now. Yeah, Cody. Is there something like JRiver? If I want to put an XBFC TV and also have it manage my TV and movie collection, all that stuff. When I looked at it a couple years ago, they, it was really a computer program. So yep. They didn't really have a sort of... You want more of an appliance type thing? Yeah. So they have the JRiver Pi. Oh, so okay, it's the Linux version that runs on you know, the Raspberry Pi. And you can set it up so you don't need the keyboard monitor and mouse there. It may end up, you may have to, have to use it like more of an endpoint though. Or if you connect HDMI, I don't know. You may be able to use a different remote. It really depends exactly what you want to do, but there's, it's Probably more possible now than it was before. Okay. Yes? You mentioned J River will rip CDs, but the uh, Rune would 
denied that to a third party ripper? Correct, 100%. Is there any difference between the uh, J River ripper versus a third party ripper? Okay, so yeah, very good question. There's difference between rippers, and so the way I would do it is get ripping software that checks the it has a checksum and checks with an accurate rip database online. So everyone else who ripped it around the world uploads the checksum, like this file is ABC123, that's the checksum. So if everyone else ripped it wrong and yours is the same checksum, then you got it wrong. But what are the odds of that, right? So at least when you rip it, you know your file is the same as everyone else's. Uh, JRiver doesn't do that. They don't do an accurate rip database check. In the grand scheme of things, it's probably not a big deal. But if you want like the ultra, I want to be sure, then you go that route. I mean, one really easy good ripper is iTunes. It doesn't do accurate rip data, database checks, but it works for a lot of people. So it's what you're comfortable with and how far you want to take it. Uh, I use DB Power App to do ripping. It'll check with the accurate rip database. And I can also output a log file in the same folder as all the songs. I don't read them, but if I ever wanted to, I could go in there and say, oh yeah, accurate rip, rip score, and oh, there was an error six seconds into this track. No wonder I'm hearing a pop or a tick. So that's available. I'll put a so, plug in for XLD. Is also a yeah, program. XLD is a free program on Mac. That'll do similar. Exact audio copy? Exact audio copy, yeah. That's another free one. Mm -hmm. If you go to a third party software and rip the CD to pull into J River, how's it get the metadata? It reads the file text. So the third party ripper, like DB Power App, <laughs> will embed all that information right into the file. You open up J River, looking at your files, and it reads it. It's like a standard. So it'll totally read it and you will. Using a third party ripper is like, I'd be 0% worried about something like that and metadata. If you use WAV files, eh, you know, you might have some issues. Anything else before we close? Last question? Okay, thank you everybody. I'll be here until they kick me out. <laughs>